I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Chuck, would you like to introduce our guest today? Absolutely. Um, today we got uh, my buddy Barry and my buddy Rick. Uh, they're our part of the research team that, that we have done for several years now. And um, Barry and Rick both have had multiple sightings and stuff, and then they want to kind of tell their story. Uh, Barry, why don't you take it from, from the start and uh, kind of talk about how we first met and, and what you brought me out there for and, and talk about some of the experiences you've had out there. Okay. Um yeah, that goes back a few years, and I had uh, been having some strange things happen around here, but I really didn't know for sure what was going on. Like, uh, my peach tree was just completely loaded down with peaches, big peaches, you know, just several bushels of peaches on this tree, and I decided one night I was going to start picking them in the morning. And so I I go out... Uh, and they get ready to pick them. And there's nothing left. And there was two or three dozen on the ground that were half bug eaten. They were even all gone. And, you know, my first thought was something had to have the hands and to move that many. Yeah. And then that rock long, there was other little things. Um, I heard one screaming at a coyote's and killed a couple of coyotes. Well, then I know pretty sure they were around here. And uh, I went out one morning to check out my barn to make sure everything's okay. Hadn't been out there in a while. I was walking in under the shed. I saw this look like finger drags down the side of the barn. So I was walking up looking at it and I just stopped. I Oh, there's got to be footprints. I looked down, there was a footprint right in front of me. And it was 18 inches by six and a half. And, um, you know, there was, I saw several things related to all this. So, um, a friend of mine, Sabella, her one, she, she told me to get hold of Chuck. And so I called Chuck and he came out and kind of went over because I wanted somebody else besides me to say what this was. And I just kind of kicked it off from there. And what about the, talk about the dog, the dogs and stuff, Barry. Okay. Um, before all this, the I have a, a dog run out by the barn and it, it's a pretty good-sized shed and a uh, big cover for the dog inside, you know, walk in. And I've got automatic feeders in there. And uh, I'd feed her once a week because I was gone a lot through the week. And uh, I couldn't figure out, all of a sudden, I'd start losing dog feed. And it got to the point I was going through 50 pounds a week for her. And she was skinny, just skin and bones. And you know, I'd take new feet out there and she'd just gobble it up. And then it got to a point where she was even digging it out and burying it. And I just kept figuring out what was wrong. Took her to the vet to see if she was on me. And I said, no, she's completely healthy enough that this skinny. And uh, that point, I, after two years, I got to notice and there was like little explosions off in a distance that would shake the house. Uh, I just thought, you know, kids were sitting off Tannerite or something like that, but then it just kept getting louder and louder. And then um, one night, it was about three in the morning, and this has been going on for a month, ever 
uh, Wednesday, Thursday night, uh, I'd hear something like a small explosion. And it was so bad that one night that I called the Sheriff's Department for see if there had been an explosion out here because it shook the house. In fact, I came out of bed. It, it, I was in the second floor where my bed, bedroom is, but it actually bounced me out of bed. And called the sheriff's department. He said, there's been nothing reported. And I said, well, this has been happening about twice a week for the last month. And he said, now that's weird. So he said, we'll, we'll keep a cruiser out there through that time period, two or three in the morning. Of course, I never, never heard back from them. And uh, I even looked to see if there was any earthquakes, but I knew they wouldn't be the same time every week. And, uh, Come to find out, uh, they were going in and had been getting the dog food out this whole time. In the winter, it would stop, but I'd have heat lamps on for the dog in there. And uh, two winters, it wasn't much happen. But the third winter, uh, I noticed a tree branch thrown in and, and uh, hit the heat lamp and, and broke it. I threw the branch out. Didn't think much about it at the time. And I uh, thought, well, maybe the wind blew it in there. But um, about two weeks later, same thing happened again. Another branch thrown in and broke the heat lamp. And things started disappearing, too. So that's, that's kind of a little bit of what was going on. What about the, the fence, Barry? Yeah, the, the chain link fence I had around that, that dog run was, um, that fence was from the 70s. It was real heavy. And the top rail was the heavy galvanized pipe. It's, it's not like the new stuff, kind of thin. It's heavy. And I noticed the chain link was kind of tore up. And I thought, well, the cows might have got against it and went under it. But I got to look and there was... No cow tracks inside, and uh, it, it was a pushed under like cows usually do, like they put their nose under at the bottom of the chain link and just go under it. Now this was pushed down, just straight down, and but there was a, about a ten foot section of top rail I found on the ground, and I just picked it up, started looking at it, and I noticed. Something didn't look right in the middle. And I thought, that looks like a finger and hand grip. And so I turned around and, and I was able to fit my fingers and thumb into it. And I thought, it looked just like something to grab the top of it and just yanked it straight up and just squished the, the, that, that conduit, the top rail, that chain link fence. And uh, I still have it. But it's just perfect for a huge end. Uh, I just stretched mine out quite a ways to get the fit. But, you know, you can see where the thumb was and the index fingers. And yeah, it was a lot of grip to squeeze that down as heavy as that tubing was. And Chuck, on the, the I, I, fingerprint, that, on the sliding on that door and the, and the footprint, Barry called me and said, if you want to see something come out here, and I did. So I witnessed it, and it was huge. And so was the handprint on the – and it was tall. It was above my, way above my head. Yeah, seven and a half feet tall is where that handprint dragged across the barn was. I, re I remember when I saw the, that, that chain link fence, and I was astounded. I mean, you could clearly see the, the fingerprint impressions – on that pipe when they shoved it, you know, pulled it up and then shoved it down on the ground. And that was just crazy to me. I mean, I, I'd never seen anything like that before. And it took yeah. a lot of strength to do that. Yeah. Because it, you know, I used, uh, that same wire back then to tie that top rail to the chain link. And that stuff was heavy. It's not like the new stuff today. It just doesn't break easy. And they were all broke loose. Just threw it on the ground and stepped over. You've you've had a lot of things happen around there, and um, 
talk about maybe some of the sightings or encounters you had, uh, like the slap on the house, and that that you you I remember you telling me about that too as well. Yeah, that was. Um, you know, we walked around trying to figure out all the things that had happened, and then when we went around to the back side of the house where they hit that that brick wall. It was at seven and a half feet also. And um, this, this house, I put a lot of cement under it just so the brick and mortar wouldn't crack. It was almost two feet by two feet slab of cement underneath. And it, in 30 years, it never did crack. And um, up at the seven and a half feet mark, the mortar was cracked coming down. But uh, at the top there, that brick was crumbled where it hit it. And what about the what about the sighting that you had that that night? Oh, that was uh, just a few days apart. The the one standing out in front of the barn. That's right. That's the one you're talking. About. Yeah. No, um, I'm talking about the one, the spider crawl. Oh. Yeah, that was that was a few days afterwards, and well, my ex had come out and picked up some mail. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We were out in the driveway talking, and she had asked me about the a little one I'd heard that was crying out here just south of the house in a brush pile. He was stressed out and crying real fast when he saw me. And, uh, well, I was telling her, you know, what I heard, and, and she asked me to, to, can you make that call? I said, yeah, and I didn't think a thing about it. It was dead calm, and uh, stupid me, I made that distressed baby cry, and it creeped her out, and she she laughed real quick, and I was walking back to the house, and I noticed my lab go running the fence, just going to get something. He was all bristled up. All of a sudden, he turned tail and ducked his tail and ran in the house. Well, when I go out at night, I've always got a bright spotlight. And so I just signed it where he was looking. And about 150 feet from me was this big silver one down on all fours, crawling straight at me just super fast. And uh, he made about two to four strides at me. And uh, then he turned wet behind the house. And I went in the house. But his old red eyes were just shining. I I could see his face, and he had a grimace on it. Just he wasn't happy. He was coming right at me. I guess I did a pretty good job on that distressed baby cry. And, uh, yeah, it was. And um, he had at least a nine foot wingspan, and that hair on him just glistened. It was so silvery just gorgeous hair and it just flowed every time his, his arm would come forward but it just flowed and uh, his chest was probably a good eight ten inches off the ground but you know like i said he had a nine foot wingspan and to get an idea of, of just how big he was his head was about the size of a five gallon bucket but the top of his head was um at least at my waist or taller and i'm six three he was he was big. You know, it's it kind of got my attention. That's the only one I've ever had come at me. Yeah, but I did not do that call again. You you still got that recording though, don't you, Barry? Well, it it wasn't the night that uh, the baby was crying. It was, um, he oh. was messing with, you know, he was whooping that little bit. Now, I've, I've got that somewhere. A little bit, the lab. Yeah, I've got that recording. And uh, I've got one of a dominant howl. And I've got several different ones. I had something, I put the recorder on the old house on the windowsill around the back side of the house where it's dark. And 
you know, it's four and a half, five feet to the windowsill. So a dog just couldn't go up and sniff it. But in the middle of the night, there was something that came up that had huge nostrils sniffing it. Uh, it was definitely wasn't a dog because it was too big. Well, you and Rick are are pretty good buddies, and and you've been, you know, you you do a job that takes you all across the country, and you guys even together have seen some some pr- pretty crazy things uh, with with these with these things. And talk about some of the stories that that you've told me about the things that you've seen out there in, in the oil patch and in other areas. Okay, um, my first first one to see clearly, I was uh, out in Roberts County, Texas Panhandle, west of Canadian, way out there on that river ranches, very desolate, very few homes, <clears throat> and this was middle of July, about eight o'clock in the evening, still you know sun's still up, and I'm driving down this lease road, and I see what I think is a the top of a, a bull behind a plum thicket. If I could see the tail head and the shoulders or the butt of the bull. And, but it was so thick. I want to know what kind of bull it is. Cause you know, I'm a farm boy. I raised cattle and had cattle for years and made my son's snowed cattle. And I couldn't figure out what kind of bull this was cause he was so stinking thick. And so I was keeping an eye on him as I was coming down the lease road. And then all of a sudden, I got word. I come up beside this plum bush, about 70 feet from where I was at. And it wasn't a bull. There was a Bigfoot down on all fours, looking right at me, and had a mouthful of plums. He'd been eating the plums off of it. Well, I was just astounded at what I was seeing. And uh, I just, I thought, I've got to, ditch or a canyon right in front of me, I'm going to run off in it and be stuck down here with him. So I looked up to see where that ditch was and looked back and he was already gone. And uh, I slammed it in park and jumped out and I started running over there and I thought, no, this thing could pick me up and use me as a toothpick. Because he was, he was over twice my width. And even down on all fours, he was still almost five feet tall. And I had my boys measure me like I said, I'm 6'3", and down on all fours, I'm three feet tall. So that kind of gives you an idea just how big this guy was. And, um, you know, I had Sibyl Irwin make a sketch of that one. And uh, he was just shoulder to shoulder was just massive. And I, I kept thinking he was standing in sand. I thought, there's got to be tracks here. I can take pictures. I've got my camera and my phone. And, but... I just didn't know enough about him to go lingering out there, but I would now. I'd go out there and probably go chase him a ways. <laughs> Not too far, though. Yeah, that that was my first real encounter with, with him. Um, that was in 2014, the first one I really saw. I had encounters through back in 83, but, you know, actually get the eyes on one when that was the first. You know, we've, I've had several encounters since then, just driving down lease roads, and there one would be. And I kind of got to watch, learn what to watch for, where they would hide, times of the day, you know, the shadows, how they stay in them. And it, I've been able to see several doing that and catch them off guard. But those trailers I pull make a lot of noise, but. I have got him off guard, but like that, that first I saw, he just, he thought he was hid. He was behind that plum thicket until I drove past it. And, and I've even had another fella told me that he had seen one on that same ranch out there. And, uh, there are reports at the BFRO about, uh, the guys on horseback that saw one down on the river. And, uh, you know, I was, I was farther west from where they were, but that's a vast open country down there. It's not a lot of people, a lot of oil field traffic, but 
not many people live down there. Now, Rick, during, during all this, you, you really didn't have much thought in, into this, did you? Did I do what? You didn't have much thought on the, the, the whole Bigfoot subject, did you, at the time? You know, I, I'm kind of like the people that, you know, I've got to see it to believe it. And uh, I was riding with Barry one day, and we was on a hot shot run, and I, I said, well, I would like to see one. And I remember what he said. He said, don't wish for something unless you really want to, because you will. So he started telling me, I was looking at the trees like I was looking for deer, because I'm a deer hunter, and that's the way I was looking. Well, that was my mistake. So Barry started telling me to look into the shadows, look for the dark spots, and man, I said, okay. And it wasn't, what was that, less than a month? I was thinking it was about three weeks later, I was uh, I was riding down the interstate, coming home, seeing my grandkids, and it was a Sunday evening. Sun was just getting down, going down, <clears throat> and I was getting ready to hit the river bridge. There's a river, and I looked over to my right, which would be to the north, northwest. There's this, I called Barry, and I was yelling, Black gingerbread man, black gingerbread. That's all I can think of. That was the biggest, whatever, you know, and it was Bigfoot walking through there and he was carrying something because his arms weren't dangling. He was just, had it like his, all I could see was both elbows. And I thought, for real, I've seen one. I saw it, you know, and, and since then, that was my first, well, I'd, I'd seen one earlier on the other side of the river but that was before this conversation I had with Barry and it was down on all fours. And I thought it was a first time I looked, I thought, wow, that's a big raccoon, but little red flag just going up. Cause me being a hunter, I thought it's not moving like a raccoon. And then I saw, I thought, well, I, it's got quills on it. I could see the quills flipping and this flopping around his run. Well, it was out in the area, open area. And it's hard to, look out there and if you don't have a point of reference you can't tell what size it is so i didn't have anything and i thought that's a big old porcupine but i thought i've never seen a porcupine run that fast well later after i had seen this one i described the the, the black gingerbread man barry said and well you even told me down at the lobby that that was probably a, a, probably a juvenile running and now I realize it was because porcupines cannot run that fast and all there was too many red flags flying up and I knew it wasn't what it was you know that semi grain truck was probably oh, yeah. there later and then later there was a semi grain truck out on the lease pad sitting there and Barry and I was going through there and I hadn't been there before we was on another run. I looked out there and I said, oh, my gosh. And I, he was there. I said, that was a big foot. Because now I had something to judge by how large this thing was. And he was coming off the river. And he was trying to get to a, a patch of trees. But the sun was going down and it was casting some pretty long shadows. And he was trying to get up in them shadows before the sun, you know, went all the way down. I figured somebody could see him and I did. So... And since then, I've seen 16 more that I have seen, and they've been all over the place. We were driving uh, up at Gage, Oklahoma, and it was, was it 97 degrees? It was, it was hot. hot. It was 97 degrees, about 2.30, 3.30 in the afternoon. And I just happened to look over, and it was the beginning of a creek. It was all pastured, and trees just started and went about seven miles into Gage, Oklahoma. Well, I'm looking up, and I'm going, what idiots out here in a tuxedo or a penguin suit? And then I went, hey, but I just started yelling, and then I realized how big it was. This thing was black and white, and he come walking up through there. Well, luckily, we had a pickup run, didn't have that 40-foot trailer. So we whooped around and come back up and parked on the side of the road. And he, I said he was walking toward those plum bushes. Well, I didn't see to the east of the plum bushes I was looking at up on a little ridge where the creek started was a bunch of other plum bushes. 
And Barry said, there he is. And he was raised his head up and looked over the plum bushes, and then he dug back down. And I'm looking at the wrong plum bushes, and I, I didn't see him doing that. But that at least both of us got to see the same one. And he was he was laying down on his stomach, and he'd do a push-up to look at us, then drop back down. And he did it several times. And I was excited, you know, when you, somebody said there's a deer in here. You're trying to look and you're trying to cover too much territory. Not I never see him jump going up and down. But I saw, the, saw him upright walking, and he was walking right toward us. He was probably, what, 150 yards? And there was nothing but short grass. I mean, no trees or nothing. Yeah, they had just swamped and bailed that pasture, and so it was short. But there was, well, there was trees on both sides, but he was walking through a clearing. I mean, we had perfect vision. Our idea, I had perfect vision of him. He was big. He was big. What is what what is your guys' take on on just the just the idea that a lot of these oil field locations out here there has been sightings from a bunch of different people and do you think they're attracted to those type of locations or do you think this is just you know, just part of the roaming territory. Well, I think they're curious, but also the the food, the trash trailers, because they grill out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've known one incident, the guy went out 2 o'clock in the morning to take trash out to the trash trailer, which is kind of in the dark, and there was something big and hairy standing not too far from it. So I think, you know, that would draw them in. And just curious what all is going on. And on the on that too, Chuck, I had a this lady cuts my hair. In fact, when she saw this, she was with her mom. They were going to a rig site. Her dad was working and pulling a double. They were bringing him clothes and some food on the rig, and they were fairly close to this rig site. They were traveling down a road, and it, the road went straight, like say you're going east but it didn't go south but they had to turn and go north to go towards the rig and she went oh and so they went on down the road and she said did you see ask her mom said did you see that she said you mean the bigfoot that was standing there right beside the tree yeah i saw him keep going (laughs) you know and he was half a mile (laughs) from the rig and this lady, I would never have thought that she had ever seen that. And I said, I had mentioned before, she cuts my hair. And I said, why have you never said this? She said, ridicule. I'm afraid people make fun of me. And that was back when she was, I think, like a senior in high school. And she's like 34, 35 years old now. So she's kept that secret all this time because of fear afraid that people were going to ridicule her or make fun of her and laugh at her, you know? And I said, I would never do that. Never. Even if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't make fun of you because you have your own thoughts. I have mine, you know? So I'm running across more and more people that are coming out and saying they saw one. And that's on that's only thing they said it could have been, and that's what they thought it was because it was big and hairy. But they they won't tell anybody or hadn't told anybody like for years. They're here. They're around here. They're all over Oklahoma. Oh yeah. Well, you know, and I think for the longest time, at least when when I had my first sighting, um, the subject of Bigfoot was really taboo. Nobody wanted to talk about it. If you saw something, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to exactly. discuss it, and and I to now now um, it seems that more and more people are realizing that hey, there's something to this, and yeah. yes, you don't you don't you don't get people laughing at you anymore or ridiculing you anymore if you decide to talk about your story or your sighting, and uh, it's just it's it's not like it used to be people are accepting it more and more than than what they used to. So. Yes, I've had since 
People know I've, I've seen them. I've had 17 local people come and tell me their story. You know, just around here. They know you've seen one, you're not going to ridicule. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've told people, and somebody said to them, oh, it must have been Bigfoot. I said, well, what do you think about Bigfoot? And the majority of them, Chuck, always say there's been too many people that have seen them. There's got to be something out there or something to this because everybody wouldn't be saying basically almost the same thing. You know, it's it, everybody's experience is different, but basically they're seeing something large and hairy. Yeah. Right. So people, they're opening or they're starting to open up and they're starting to realize, Hey, there is something out there. Well, and you know, I've, I've figured up today. I have seen, Eight from the interstate and two from uh, just a regular highway. And I have two, you talked about the interstate, and and that that's where the river kind of goes through there, right? Is that is that right. pretty much that right. area? I'm one of them. Yeah, but I saw two Chuck that was just right outside the about a mile or so from Yukon, Oklahoma. And a guy was on a tractor going down a, a thick tree road. Since since then, he's built buildings around there, and he's cleaned out those trees. And you can see through them. Used to, you couldn't even, couldn't even see through them. You couldn't even hardly see through it in the winter time with no trees. Is what they was just thick. Now he's got it all cleaned out. But he was pushed up. A road grader had come through there, and then he was had put up a probably a four foot berm, and he was trying to get more with a little. Uh, blade behind a tractor and so I was looking for basically I was just looking for deer and it was about 11 o'clock one morning I was heading home from visiting my grandkids and I looked over and I almost hit broadside a semi I was past me and I looked over there and it looked like the biggest gorilla I'd ever seen in my life with his knuckles on the top of that uh, wind roll berm of, of dirt and he was looking to the east and that's where that tractor was and that tractor was probably 150 200 yards away from him and he was looking at that tractor and just had his knuckles down just like a gorilla would do you know how they put their knuckles and then a week later on the south side of these trees my nephew lived in a house there's 13 houses in there called lost lake but there's a little lake in there and the trees is all through there. Well, I get off the exit. This is a week later, the next weekend. I get off and I'm almost there. And I'm like, oh, I better look down through there. And I looked up there and there was a young juvenile that had a hold of a the branch and he was leaning out as far as he could. And his other hand was just swinging and touching the dirt. And he was looking and I looked down there and the farmer or whatever he was, was doing the little dirt work down there, and he was watching him. And he was probably, he wasn't probably 100 feet from me. And I almost missed him because I didn't even look down there. And that was in the same area. And then I think you saw it, didn't you? I saw one uh, early one morning. There was a, a, you could see the pond, and to the south of the pond, uh, there was a gap in the trees. You know, I would I estimate it was probably 100 feet wide the gap was. And there was a big one walking in between that gap. And it was it was probably seven in the morning. I wasn't quite up yet. See that guy come in there and did all that construction and everything. He he built some ponds right there by the, the interstate and he's built he's building a huge barn there now. And he cleared out all of that stuff and I think he's run them out now. Because he they I don't think they were moving around because they didn't like him clearing all this stuff out. And the People that live in those houses didn't either because now you can look through from the interstate and, and over a quarter mile away or a little bit, you can see those houses. And they want to be secluded from the interstate. And something that was interesting to me, um, right there at the same spot, there was a low area that uh, used to be a dirt road to come underneath oh, there. And there was, uh, it yeah. had to turn, but they put a, a bridge on that creek 
And once we got through as a bridge, I came through there one morning, and there's this huge tree thrown up against that bridge. You know, it wasn't done by equipment because they couldn't get equipment down in that creek to do that. But now this tree was from oh. the creek up to the bridge was probably 15, 20 feet. And then the tree was another 15, 20 above the, the bridge. And huge. And right. huge. And they had to get uh, equipment in there and chainsaw to cut it up and get it out of there. Wow. And so, water wouldn't have stood it up like that. No, no. If it even would move it. Yeah. It was huge. It's a small well, creek. I, and it's standing like- up. I would like for you guys to talk about our experiences in Brown Springs. Okay. Um, I, I know at the time you had a thermal, and and I think we we can all agree that we're there. That if you would have had a, a SIM card in your in your thermal imager, we would have got probably the best uh, recording of a thermal image Bigfoot when, when two of our other guys that were with us, uh, took off after you want to talk about that? Uh, Oh, on the, at the campsite. Yeah. They're, they're at the campsite. Yeah. They're at the campsite. Cause, um, yeah, we were sitting there around that fire and, you know, you and I both had a gut feeling they were around. And so I picked up my thermal and mine, I, all I can do is take snapshots. And so I, I turned it on and was looking around. I saw a heat signature over where this tree stump was. And uh, then I saw another one back behind it. And so I told you about it and I'm showing you and um, Larry and somebody else. I forgot who it was. Anyway, they went, yeah, D, yeah, it was D. They took off to the right and was going to make a circle back towards it. Well, I could see on my thermal, they would turn their head and watch them. And uh, they were up, came up close to that stump. Well, when the guys started getting close to the stump, they the Bigfoot started backing off. And when they got over to the stump, because they were asking me, you know, where are they at? And I'd, I'd tell them. And uh, they got to the stump and then turned and come back to the campfire. And when they did that, uh, the two came back up to the stump. You know, it, that was kind of neat. And, and the, what about the... What about the the the, uh, the igloos that we found out, out there? Yeah, that was that was neat. That whole area when we got in there, it just reeked of a playground to me. The way the trees were, I mean, the branches come right down to the ground. These things could just run all over those huge, huge oak branches, and uh, saw this igloo shape. And um, as I felt a little uncomfortable there, you know, if this I was, think, a, I think we all. Did. I was, yeah, I was a little nervous, and but uh, you said you were taking pictures of it. I, I was looking around, just keep an eye out. You said you got eye shine. Well, I grabbed my thermal and turned it on. Yeah, there was a small heat signature inside that, and I got to watch them. He would look towards you, and he'd move move around, and uh, and then when you got up pretty close. I could actually see it like a heartbeat on a heat signature and it was fast. It was rapid. And, uh, you know, and that was pretty. I don't, I don't mean to we interrupt were, you, but at, at the same time, this was all going on. Do y'all remember the, the branches and, and the foot stomping and the whistling that was going on at the same time that was, we were all kind of standing around there. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, because I was, I was hanging on my 44, too, at the time. <laughs> I never drawed it out because I knew that might be a big mistake, but I just had it ready. And, yeah, you could hear the whistles and then you could hear snapping and 
I don't, I couldn't tell if they were running or they were just stomping. Right. But I didn't know they were there. <laughs> and then, then D and Larry came in and, and fin- finished that story off. Yeah. Uh, they were talking about, they thought they had one follow on the end. And uh, Larry went over to the high side to see if they could get a view inside that uh, the igloo. And uh, I believe him and you didn't do both start getting closer to the igloo. Uh, I never um, did. I, I stayed right right where I was, and I and I think if I remember correctly, you were right there with me the whole time. And D yeah, and Larry, right. actually, D and yeah. Larry both came over and looked at the heat signature. And yeah. uh, when D got up to the entrance of that, that thing, um, all the whistling and all the stuff that was going on, because D uh, would always do the same whistle every time he went out to this location. And yeah. it got really quiet when he started whistling. Yeah, and it's then like he, they calm yeah calm down and then d went up on top well he actually looked in i think i can't remember he didn't go into the structure but he got really close to the door and of the structure but it wasn't really a door it was anyway just enough and i think he, he went up to the top and didn't he say that as he looked down in there he saw something go into the sand bank there and and cover itself up with dirt or something you remember that yeah he, that looked like a hole back in there and uh when it did that at the same time he was talking about it my thermal it just kind of faded off in that same spot and so it probably was a, a way for them to get out and they could push that dirt up behind them do you think it was a little one or an adult Oh, uh, it, was, it was a baby. Was a baby. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty small. But and the next day yeah. we went over to we went to the Texas side. Yeah, and found well, a, another igloo that was big just like it. Yeah, it's yeah. bigger. It was it was big. And I, I kind of like what happened that night. When we went walking that around, night. oh yeah, and we had those, you know, there was four or five following us, and there was me and you towards the tail end, and we came up on that um, big hickory tree that was snapped over, and y'all yeah. were checking it for bugs or wind damage, and didn't find anything because it was right in the middle of a bunch of other trees, and it had just been broke over, and it was uh, probably a twelve-inch trunk. And while y'all were looking at that, I was watching, I'd heard some noise to the right of me, and I, I turned the thermal on it, and uh, there was four sets of ice shine at me, and I could watch them. They would look back at each other, they'd look at us, and then one came right in the middle of them, would be the fifth one, and was watching. And then once y'all decided that you know, that wasn't a natural break. Y'all started moving on. Well, I stayed there for a little bit just to see what they would do. And uh, they backed into the brush and disappeared. And then I caught up with y'all. That was that was interesting. And they, right. they could have been 20 to 30 feet from me. They were close. Oh, yeah. Didn't you look at those eye shines on the thermal? Yes, I did. I remember that. I was thinking you and Larry and D also came over and looked. Yeah. I, you know, I think the one thing that really amazed me the most on the Texas side, not only did we see that igloo and find that other igloo looking shape, but there were cottonwood trees out there. You remember those? Oh. They were probably two and three, two to three feet in diameter. You remember those yeah. trees? I've and they were, they were bro- and they were broken about ten feet off the ground, and yeah. we could tell it wasn't storm damage because 
those were the only trees that were actually damaged in some way. And yeah. what was there? Was there like four or five of those trees? There were several. Yeah. Yeah. There was several. But there was one of them, I, I estimate it's probably 15 feet high where it broke. Oh, at least. Yeah. yeah. Cotton was typically, they just blow over or they break the branches up at the top. They don't snap in the middle of the trunk. Yeah, and every one of those were were broken. Yeah. Yeah, they were. But well, they one more done. story I'd like for you, for both of you to 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 talk about because we were all there, is uh, our trip to Honeby. And yep. and we we've kind of talked about Honeby on on the show a couple times, and but tell tell the, about the event that we all that we all had that night. That was a crazy night. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were kind of sitting around the campfire, and there was, I think there was 10 of us there, if I remember right. And uh, tell them we were at a guy's house. We weren't out in the yeah. woods either. Yeah, we were in his, his backyard, and uh, it was on uh, kind of the northeast side of Hanabi. And uh, we were just out there visiting, and uh, people were asking us about some of my stories, and and uh, I remember you said you was going to go over by the garage and, and hear you make that call. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good call. And we kept talking, and, and all of a sudden we heard this huge, huge scream. It was immediately after he did that. Yeah. And uh, you come running around the garage and said, guys, that wasn't me. Guys, that wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> and then we see the <laughs> Yeah, and then the deer were running, and then uh, to the south there was a church. You know, it was three or four hundred yards out there, but it had enough lights. You know, it was leaving a silhouette, and uh, we got a glimpse of him running. Well, Larry and I take off over there, and I had my thermal, and uh, we get out there, and I couldn't find him, but there was something different on the ground that I could not make out. It didn't have a good heat signature. And I couldn't figure out why, but there was a lump over there. And I told Larry, there's something there, but there's not much heat to it. Well, we stood there for a little bit, and we started walking closer. And then somebody hollered, there he goes. So I whirled my thermal back around, and I found him. And he was heading east. He was hooking it. And uh, I looked back at the spot where I saw that lump, and it was gone. But that was real heavy dew. And I guess he had rolled into that grass, and it just kind of killed the heat. But you know, he took off to the east, and we took off after him. It was swampy. In that it was kind of swampy area, and Larry and I ran up on that pool of water, and we both stopped, and I said, did you hear him go through that? And no, neither one of us heard it. And it was 20 or 30 feet wide, and he must have just jumped it because he didn't go through it. He did. He was silent about it. And Chuck, to make to let people realize how big these creatures are, I was standing there. I was probably 30, 35 yards away. And Barry went there and Larry did. Now, Barry's 6'3. Larry is 6'2. And one was to the, the when he, the Bigfoot jumped up, he was kind of in between them. And one was on the right and one was on the left there. They look like children out there when he jumped up. I, that's what really has stuck in my my vision, my mind, that how little they look compared to him when he jumped up. And he was, and he was tall, but he was big, too. Now, what about the Subway sandwiches that you guys had? Oh, or was, I was thinking about that one. Um well, that, the night before that, you know, I, I'd borrowed a, an RV that a friend of mine had had made out of oil field equipment. It's extremely heavy and rigid. It doesn't move much. And I was sleeping there on the same place. About one in the morning, that trailer rocked. It did just rock a little. It rocked a bunch. And I thought, well, there's one out here. And uh, I got the next morning and tried to rock it, and I couldn't move it. And uh, then I heard 
you hollered at me. And he said, why'd you leave your pickup door open? I said, I didn't. I remember shutting it. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> I look inside. I thought, whoa. I could see on the console, the pickup, these huge fingerprints. And uh, I had a, a Subway sandwich I'd eaten on the way down and a Sonic sandwich. Well, they were both opened up and finished up in the pickup. And uh, and then I believe as you walked over to me and said, uh, look at your driver's side window. Because everything was just covered in dew, just heavy, heavy dew. Mm -hmm. And there's this brown looking face that had looked into the pickup. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I got pictures of that and of the fingerprints. And but somebody said, Well, it's probably a druggie or something. And I said, I've got a camera sitting here, I've got two pistols sitting out in the open, and my billfold and everything's sitting there, and nothing's bothered. Just the food. Just the food. And then we walked around the other side of the pickup and found that, that track that was about I think it was fifteen inches on the passenger side. And it was muddy. But yeah, that was that was pretty interesting. Especially see that face looking at me when the, you hollered and said, look at this. Another thing, yeah. too, Chuck, when we were down there at Hanabi, I don't think you were down there at the one time. <clears throat> we parked his 40 uh, foot fifth wheel into this area and just step out and just a couple of feet, you're at a 100 foot drop off canyon down through the trees. Well, the <laughs> first night, we got down there a day or two early and Barry's up in the loft up there in the in the, the bedroom. I'm down on the couch. I wake up and the trailer is shaking. So I jump up and I run up there and he's got a little slide out where he can look down the side of the trailer. I said, Barry, the trailer's shaking. I said, look outside. He didn't want to look outside. He said, you look outside. I didn't want to look outside either. And be coming face to face. Well, I went back to bed and sat there, and then it shaked. It was started shaking again. Then I hear a, and it quit real quick, and he walked away. Now, get this. When I say it was shaking, it was pushing it long ways, not sideways, tipping it over. He was pushing it the length of that trailer. And and on the back side? It. On the front side? On the back side where I was sleeping. Yeah, and, mm. and that trailer was 14,000, and it's got six hydraulic jacks that level it and stand on it. So that was something to move that trailer. But it sounded like a, a larger adult, I guess, and, and the way they, the, the, from what I gathered from the sound was they were mad and was like, stop it, you know, just leave it alone. And, I mean, it, it quit immediately when that, the, 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 the the voice sounds was there. It quit immediately, but it was solid rocks all through there. And we, and we, we looked the next morning. We see if we could find a footprint around. We never could find one. They must have stayed on those rocks, and we couldn't we couldn't find anything. Yeah. Thought maybe we might find blood, but it was so rocky and different colored rocks. It was hard, you know, very hard to look and see. Well, what about what about tracks? I know we found one at at your house. You guys remember going to Pocket City and uh, doing an investigation for uh, for a lady that yeah. contacted us. You, <clears throat> you remember the tracks that we found in her backyard? What size those were? Yes, it was yep. huge. Yeah, and was sunk down what three four inches or something like that. It was big. Was it a twenty three? Twenty three inches. So, it was yeah. yeah that's what i'm and you know that the amazing the amazing thing that the that i had during that that trip was this was in the middle of town yeah yeah uh, you guys remember there were houses everywhere yeah and and i i remember first driving up there and thinking there's there's no way there's bigfoot coming into town like this and um, the more and more we, we reached, 
the more and more we researched around there, the more and more we realized, yeah, they're coming into town. Yeah. I had a local guy told me, uh, well, he was asking me, he said, well, these things come into town? I said, yeah, they've been known to, you know, go through dumpsters and, and, and just follow the creeks. He said, well, he lived just off of Elk Creek in town. And he said, two o'clock one morning, he had his window open because it was nice and was cool breeze coming in. He said, I heard something out in the alley. And he said, there was enough light, you know, city light and moonlight. He said, I could see something bent over in the dumpster. And I watched it for a minute and he stood up. He said, this thing was huge. It was black and it was hairy. And he said, would they come up and kill through the dumpsters? I said, absolutely. They find food that easy. And he probably was at, oh, two, three hundred feet from the Elk Creek. Well, you know, we yeah, have all kinds, of reports, all kinds of reports around the casinos in the area, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so... And then the ones on the south side of town, there by the golf course, there's been several reports there. And, uh, you know, I mean, it'd be easy for them to go right up to that residential area. That Those uh, alleys up in that area don't have any light. So it'd be perfect pickings for them. <clears throat> and right there at the golf course, and they're here in Elk City, right across the street on the east side of Highway 6, is a house you drive a pretty good distance in there and it's back in behind some trees and some little small hills and a friend of mine well he's a car salesman he sold me my pickups i've been buying for the past few years and his daughter was a senior in high school wanted to ha- just had to have a, a horse so she he got her a horse well she he always told her you're going to feed it and you got to take care of it well her and the boyfriend he forgot and it was 10 o'clock at night so he asked her, or, or she asked him to go with her to feed because her grandmother lived there, but she'd be asleep. So they went in and they fed and everything. Well, they were coming back out, and I think it was 30, 40 feet, wasn't it? Somewhere? 20 feet. 20 feet. Okay. There was a Bigfoot standing there up a tree, and then, of course they took off. Well, since then, her dad has told me that she won't even go back down in there. She, she, Told him to sell the horse. She won't go back in there. She did. She wouldn't. She go back in there with him in the daylight. But when it started getting dark, she wanted out of there. Well, then he went down there one day, and he was telling me. He said he was mowing the grass. It was his mom, so he was mowing the grass for. Her. Well, he said he looked over, and uh, I think you'd talked to this guy, and yeah, Barry had talked to him. Well, I had too, because play cards with him, and uh, he he said. I remember you saying, look for the darkest spot. And he said, I looked over and he thought, that's a pretty good spot, black. Well, he's driving around. Well, the lights on his mower, it was getting dark, real dark. And uh, he couldn't see too good. Well, when he come back around, he said that black spot had moved over about 20, 30 feet to the other side. And he said, I just turned that thing around, cut right through there. And he said, I was done. <laughs> he said, I'll do that in the, in the morning. So he saw a dark figure twice. I mean, right there within a lap of doing the yard, you know, and that thing was sitting there watching him. And that was in that same place where his daughter had, and boyfriend had seen that, that one standing there 20 feet away. And that's, that's almost in the city limits. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you court. guys, have, I know you guys have had lots of sightings and, you know, we've had some, really good times out there and uh we've learned a lot and done a lot and i appreciate you guys coming on uh will force you guys got any questions or any comments or anything fascinating interview forrest how about you you know it was real uh real interesting i'm glad to do it for you oh yeah always a pleasure well, guys, thank you for thank you for coming on the show and and uh, telling some of your stories, and uh, we definitely appreciate it. And you guys know I'll be in touch with you. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having us, Chuck. Appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Thank you, fellas, and we'll have to have you back again. 
Sure, you bet. Anytime. All right. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.